welcome to Cambridge Learn's partner webinar. Tonight is going to be on special needs, which is actually an area of interest for me. So I hope you will participate fully. I welcome you all with your thoughts, your concerns. Uh, let's dispel some myths about Cambridge international education and whether it's suited for special needs or not, because there's a lot of uh, belief out there that uh, Cambridge is too academically rigorous or unsuited for whatever reason to students with learning challenges, barriers to learning or disabilities as it used to be known. So that's what tonight is going to focus on. So I welcome all participation. Please don't be shy. There's a Q&A chat box at the bottom. Feel free to post your questions or comments or to even share your stories because some real life anecdotes might help dispel this myth that online education, when it's an internationally benchmarked curriculum like Cambridge International, that British International Exam Board, there's that myth out there that then it can't be used by children that are maybe not neurotypical, not of your typical abilities and strengths and profiles. Ultimately, of course, every child is unique, right? So let's start out by, by dealing with that. You know, what is the average child? I think the very nature of homeschooling is that we personalize learning, right? The idea that every child is unique and can be can be schooled in their own individual way. They can actually have a tailored educational plan. So in a formal educational sector, it's often called a individualized learning plan, okay? Or a personal learning plan, right? An ILP uh, or a learner personal learning plan, okay? What is that? It's really just uh, a plan that's drawn up in consultation with teachers and often with uh, assessors of all kinds, psychometrists, educational psychologists, maybe some therapists who might be on the case, sometimes with input from medical practitioners too, because some of the therapists may well be uh, classified as uh, medical uh, practitioners, they might be registered with the medical board, they might be physiotherapists, or occupational therapists, or speech and language therapists, or counselors, or remedial therapists, and they might even uh, give you, you know, invoices that you can recover back from your medical health insurance. So those plans are something that sometimes gets done at inclusive schools. Okay, so tonight is about debunking some of those uh, myths about whether Cambridge International, that education system is suited to kids with those barriers because the perception out there does seem to be, there's this myth really that I wanna bust that uh, it's not suited for kids of that kind, okay? But we have to just take a step back. So in regular schools, conventional schooling as I'd call it, traditional bricks and mortar schools, you get schools that are inclusive and you get schools that are exclusive. Exclusive schools are ones that have entrance requirements where they can bar entry if you don't meet minimum academic levels and they can be discerning in terms of whether you can afford their fees. So private schools or independent schools worldwide are generally exclusive. They can choose who they admit and that exclusion allows them to obviously have a student body that's pre-selected and will then tend to be more homogenous. In other words, more of one kind of student, more typically falling within the average IQ range and also not having at least self-evident learning challenges. Okay, that will be the typical profile of exclusive schools. Then you get inclusion, in education, which is the modern trend to not separate out students, okay? We used to put students with special needs in separate schools called remedial schools, okay? We used to put kids with cognitive impairment in different schools, kids with, uh, you know, visual impairment and et cetera. Now we of the belief due to research that actually there's a benefit to all kids to actually school together. Obviously they have different needs and they need to be catered for differently. We're not suggesting treat everybody equally or the same. You do have to give more, for example, exam accommodations. So it's testing concessions to children who have exam anxiety or exam uh, difficulties. Okay, so that's true. All right, so we're not suggesting you treat every child identically, but inclusion says you actually allow 
children of all abilities of all kinds of profiles uh, in terms of the, uh, the intellect, the cognitive performance, the health, the physical abilities, you actually allow all kinds of children to school with you. Now, that is one of the benefits of an online school, such as can be learn, right? A virtual school is not space limited, but also does not have to be selective. It can be, you can have an entrance procedure and you can have an admissions process and you can screen, but we've chosen not to at Cambridge. So that's the first thing to be aware of. There are no entrance requirements and that ease of entry is an advantage. There are no paperwork requirements. And I'm talking about not just, you know, birth certificates and identification documents, but also school report cards from prior institutions or academic records or transcripts or entrance testing. Nothing like that is required. Yes, there are some placement tools that we can make readily available to you to help you decide which level to enter into at a subject uh, by subject choice. And keeping in mind with the British international school system, you can actually mix grade levels. So it does make placement even more freeing, but also therefore more complex because it's not like the CAP system, the South African national curriculum system, where you enter on the same level for all subjects. You have to, right? You cannot really mix levels when you're going to school in the South African curriculum system because it's not designed to mix grade levels, right? So it's not possible to advance to the next grade level and to carry over a subject from the previous grade level. Think of a traditional school. Remember that the CAPS system was designed for traditional schools. Having said that, so was the British international system. Okay, Cambridge International was not actually designed to be done from a distance. It can be, and I think it lends itself to be because it's not a diploma system, right? It's a certificate system. What I mean by that is Cambridge, you take a subject at a time. You can compose the subjects you take at your choice. There is a recommended set of subjects that you take at each grade level defined often by what's called the core, the Cambridge essential subjects, the Cambridge core being English, maths, and science. Why? Well, makes sense, right? Because literacy, numeracy, and scientific inquiry are considered essential skills in Cambridge. But then there's a whole lot of other subjects that you might need to take to comply with every country's school leaving requirements. But those are now country specific. They vary by where you school, and they also vary by where you wish to apply to university with. So. Every country places its own requirements upon the Cambridge system as to university entrance. South Africa, for example, says you have to have two languages. You have to have a second language. Okay, Many countries require only English as a first language. They don't worry about a second language. South African Cambridge international students can actually have a world language and go to university in South Africa. They do not have to take a second official language. Okay, so you don't have to take maths for matric with Cambridge International because Cambridge itself does not mandate any subjects per se. You can take any combination of subjects at will. You can take just one subject through Cambridge. You can take a Cambridge subject side by side with another curriculum. That's how freeing it is. So that in itself lends itself to personalization of learning, right? Because you can now customize a learning plan for a child with special needs, and you can then take on subjects as and when they're able to take them on. You don't have to load them with all the prerequisites. So for example, in the foundation phase of CAPS, which is your grade one, two, and three, you have to take four subjects, English, maths, second language, which we offer Afrikaans, and life skills. You just have to. Life skills is mandatory in CAPS, for example. There is an equivalent in Cambridge called Global Perspectives. It's not quite life skills. It's beyond that. There's also research skills involved there. But in teamwork and collaboration and project-based assessing, but there is actually a life skills course being offered from January, for example, on Cambridge, but it can also be offered to CAPS if you don't want to do the CAPS life skills, and that's the socio-emotional learning course we're offering. So we do have a range of subjects that are then considered optional extras in Cambridge, okay, but that does mean that then you can focus on just the core skills that you need to acquire. And that's one of the benefits of, I would say, the British international system is that it focuses more on core skills. So it's a more time efficient system. And that just in itself lends itself to special needs because you can focus on core skills and you don't have to take 
non-essential subjects that are being prescribed by an educational authority. You see, because no one actually has to do certain subjects according to Cambridge itself. It's only the national authorities that might require certain subjects, but generally those requirements only befall you when you get to the school leaving phase of your school career. In the lower grades, there are no actual prerequisites or entrance requirements or mandated subjects or a mandatory minimum number of subjects in the Cambridge International System. So how freeing is that? Okay, so you may have a child that struggles with subject load. In other words, in CAPS, especially when you get to the higher grades, there can be a multiplicity of subjects, like nine, 10 or more. And that can be overwhelming for a child who lacks focus or who is highly distractible or who is inattentive or who is hyperactive or who is highly anxious or who's just lacking in executive functioning. Right. In other words, in the ability to execute, to plan and to coordinate himself and to time manage. Most teenagers are poor at time management skills, especially when it comes to non-preferred tasks like schooling. But generally, you have kids who can make do and you have some kids who just struggle. They battle. Right. Their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed yet. Of course, it's not fully developed in boys till many, many years later till after they've left school, but it's more developed in some than in others, okay? But I'd say it's stereotypical, but probably true of that stereotype to say that girls tend to mature earlier in terms of their abilities to multitask and to also organize themselves, okay? And to execute functions. That's why we tend to regard girls as more diligent or studious. I am stereotyping here. Obviously, the gender roles may be reversed, and there are many boys who are very studious and, and very compliant, and there are many girls who are not. Okay, so I am generalizing, but there's a reason why those stereotypes exist, because research has shown that the brain centers in girls tend to biologically, physiologically develop at an earlier age than in boys. So, for example, you'll tend to get more boys being diagnosed with special needs or with learning challenges, with difficulties with learning. Why? Because of their physiological, anatomical brain development. It's quite developmentally appropriate, actually, in many cases that boys develop later in some of these skills. So again, why would Cambridge International be suited for this? Well, because it doesn't presume that every child develops at the same rate and that you have to hit certain age-appropriate milestones or else you have to repeat the year. Okay, let me repeat that because that's quite a revolutionary idea. The Cambridge International System does not presume that children have to hit certain age appropriate milestones or else have to repeat. Yes, okay. In other words, this idea that you have to be held back, you have to be retained and repeat a grade and often a whole grade's worth of subject. It's worse than that, right? I have a category for that and that's Nonsense, okay, there's no other name for it because we have so much research in education that proves that repeating a whole year's worth of subjects does not actually lead to improved educational outcomes in children. Isn't that interesting? Something that teachers probably won't tell you, but it's unequivocal research, it's indisputable. There is no contrary or contraindicated research. There's no one who will be able to prove with any scientific evidence to the contrary that repeating is actually not beneficial. In fact, I'd argue that in many cases it's harmful. The child suffers self-esteem issues and gets bored and gets even more problematic in terms of their behavior and then develops all kinds of behaviors that get misdiagnosed, mislabeled, and sometimes inappropriately medicated. And it's purely because they're actually bored. Okay, and this often happens with kids who are intellectually quite capable, but may have concentration difficulties or may just be insufficiently stimulated at school. They're not catered for personally, they're bored, then they actually start developing educational gaps. So even children who are diagnosed as, you know, tested scientifically by IQ testing to be academically capable, in other words, to be intellectually superior in intelligence, what we call giftedness. Okay, and then many kinds of giftedness I know, but difficult to measure artistic giftedness. You know it when you see it, but you know, when you see a great painter or sculptor or musician, right, or ballerina or dancer of some kind, but it's hard to measure in a diagnostic test. But we have plenty of intellectual tests to administer. We can pretty accurately determine which children have the intellect to be considered gifted, to be considered on the extreme end of the continuum. 
and not in the middle of the bell curve, right? And those kids can still have learning difficulties. We forget that no matter how intellectually capable and gifted you may be, you can develop gaps in your learning and skills can be lacking. And that's often because you're understimulated. Okay, so how do you cater to the entire spectrum of children? Well, because Cambridge doesn't require that children meet certain milestones at a certain age, it means that you are free to develop at your own speed. And it is not a linear progression. That's the other problem with traditional schooling is that in a bricks and mortar school, because it's mass schooling, you have to then combine children by age and you have to graduate and progress them by age. Okay, so yeah, I've got a good question. Yolandi, thank you so much, Yolandi Walkinshaw. What's the difference between Cambridge and GED? Okay, I can actually share a whole document of them. They're actually partners of ours in Namibia. Okay, so GED is the American uh, High School Diploma Program. It does actually uh, give you a matric equivalence in South Africa, or in Namibia, it actually is recognized even for university entrance. It is a different kind of system, okay? The official name of the GED is that it's a testing service. At the end of the day, it's culminative testing. It only does testing at the end of your school career. So it does not have primary school or middle school, as the Americans call it, material. It only has high school material, and it's only going to test you on that material at the end of your high school career. And it's meant to be a quick way of getting an American high school diploma equivalent. It was designed in the 40s, yeah, that long ago. It's been around a long time, not as long as Cambridge, but a long time, for the American GIs who were returning from their military service and had actually dropped out of school to go serve their country. And now they wanted these GIs to have an opportunity to actually finish school rapidly without having to go back to bricks and mortar schools. Because you can imagine, you know, they were now grown up, they'd seen war, okay? They were older than their peers. It would be very uncomfortable for them to have to go back to school. So they did it through other means. Okay, in those days, there weren't online means, but it was book-based and it was done through a form of testing. Now you can do that online testing and it is a way of finishing school quite cheaply, but it is not meant to be university preparatory. I just want to clarify. No one claims that the GED was meant to prepare you for university. And very simply why it cannot, it's because it's largely multiple choice testing. It's computer-based assessment. Okay, the problem with that is that, of course, we all know that once you get to university, you don't get exclusively tested by multiple choice. There's a lot of writing involved. There is a lot of expression in written form, long questions, shorter questions, and other ways of testing other than multiple choice. And it isn't computer-based. It has become more computer-based because of COVID, but often it's paper-based. That's the way Cambridge exam. So that will be another difference. Cambridge exam with a mix of multiple choice, short questions, long questions, but always paper-based, always handwritten. So it's a very more old school way of testing. And it also involves testing from year one of school. So Cambridge is a full education system. It's not a testing service. It's not a culminating testing service. It's not meant to quickly give you a school leaving qualification. In fact, here's something interesting to think about. Cambridge does not give you a school leaving qualification. Okay. The Cambridge certificate system is a subject by subject system. Yolanda, you don't come out with a diploma from the University of Cambridge saying you have finished school because they're not a school system. They're a competency-based system. In other words, you have to prove mastery subject by subject. You compile your certificates to add up to what will be considered in your particular territory as a school leaving qualification. So you see the difference. Okay, you don't, of course, have to do any particular level of Cambridge before you can sit the final school leaving exams of Cambridge. You can just sit the AS levels. Okay, you can just sit IGCSE exams or grade 10, 11 equivalent. You don't have to have done the prior years of Cambridge. Okay, but the GED has no prior years to its final exams. It only has those exams. So you see the difference. Okay, but if you would like to know more, Yolanda, please contact me after this webinar and I can share more detailed comparison between the two systems. Okay, I want to get back to the special needs education. All right, so ways that you can personalize learning with the British international system. Well, you've got fewer subjects that you have to take. In fact, you have no subjects you have to take technically until you get to the end of your school career. But throughout your career, you can pace 
the learning to suit you. So that allows you to both accelerate learning for children who are strong at certain subjects. So for academically gifted children or those with splinter skills, right? You often get kids with special needs who are particularly talented or particularly strong in certain subject areas. They can advance quicker in those subject areas and they can go slower in the other areas. Okay, so it doesn't hold you back. You don't have to repeat a school year at any stage because you have not met the requirements for progressing in a subject. In fact, there are no prerequisites. It's not like you can actually be held back in the British international system from progressing even in a subject in which you've not demonstrated mastery. Interesting, huh? So it's not a progression system whereby you must have come from a previous grade in Cambridge to go into the next grade. You can enter into Cambridge at any grade level. And there are no age restrictions because again, it's not a cohort system. It's not like a traditional school where you've got age-based milestones to reach. Not at all. You can write any exam for Cambridge at any age. But of course, if you're not exam ready, if you haven't covered the work, you're not going to be able to pass it. So it's pointless, you know, getting a four-year-old going to write matric level exams. But in theory, it's technically possible. Okay. The freedom that provides is that every child can learn at their own pace. So it's true self-paced learning. It's also self-timed assessment though. So it's not just about learning at your own speed in different subjects, going at different speeds in different subjects. It's also about only sitting the exams when you're exam ready. That's why I'm gonna say something quite controversial here. Listen carefully. In theory, you should never fail a Cambridge exam. Now you're gonna to say to me why? It's nonsense. People fail the Cambridge exam all the time. Yes, you're right, they do. But why? Because you were never compelled to write those exams. With one caveat, there are instances where if you're at a traditional Cambridge school, you have to write exams at a certain point in the year. Like they don't allow you to defer exams or just to not write exams that year, to, to you know, opt out. You have to write exams because they run like a conventional school. So they are now fitting the Cambridge International Curriculum into a school system like the South African school system. So they've tried to fit it into a 12 year school system, even though it's technically a 13 year school system. It starts at a younger age, technically, but they've tried to map it onto the South African school system. Now you can do that with any school system in the world and many schools throughout the world do that to Cambridge, okay? They change it or they tweak it so that it matches their school system, okay? but the reality is you don't have to. You can do it at your own pace and you can examine only when you're ready. So technically, if you wrote an exam and you failed, you weren't ready, which means that should have been determined before you set the exam. Now, how do you do that? Well, this is where the independent objective assessment that Cambria Learn provides is critical. By having ongoing assessment, you are being evaluated continuously and the more feedback you get the better and that will tell you whether you are now exam fit and exam ready if you have been doing those practice exams and doing those continuous assessments as they're intended objective assessment so you do it under controlled conditions you time yourself so you limit yourself you simulate exam conditions now those are going to be marked like their exams because guess what in Cambulin's case they are all exam paper questions we use nothing but exam questions for all our assessments with assignments termly tests mock exams final exams we only ever use exam paper questions we don't allow teachers to make up their own why? Because we then know that you're doing questions on Cambridge standard. Now, if we also mark them according to Cambridge standard, keeping in mind that our teachers have been trained in the Cambridge assessment standard, so they know how to allocate marks, they know how to score you, then you will have an indicator of whether you're exam ready or not. And I can tell you now that it's almost impossible if you are failing our exams and our tests and our continuous assigning of assessments like exam papers or assignments it's almost impossible that you'll then pass the final exam if you're failing our assessments if you're passing our assessments i would say it's highly unlikely not impossible but highly unlikely that you're going to fail the external exams why well because you've been writing external type exams all the way through the year and you'll be marked by Cambridge examiners. Of course, there are aberrations. They're always last minute, you know, 
brain freezes and panic attacks. And, you know, you might have just had a paper that you had a very bad experience of. Well, the beauty of Cambridge is you can just retake that exam six months later, right? If it's external exams, you don't have to repeat the whole subject. So again, it doesn't hold you back. That's why it's not a system that retains you, that holds you back, that makes you repeat the school year. Isn't that interesting? Okay, now do you see the benefits of that for kids with special needs? Because they're not penalized. There's no punitive consequences to them struggling with a particular subject. They can advance in the subjects in which they're strong, which means they get that self-esteem enhancement. They get that boost to their self-confidence academically. And that's so powerful because kids who battle at school, for whom school is so difficult or a grind, they will benefit from having splinter skills being reflected in academic results, right? In having something show them that they actually are capable, giving them positive feedback. Otherwise, they're just getting negative feedback all the time, or they're being overwhelmed by subjects in which they're struggling because those will hold them back. It doesn't matter how excellent they may be at other subjects. If they're not sufficiently capable across all subjects, they're made to repeat all of them. Here's a horror story. I had a student move from a South African private school because he had failed English by 1% in grade nine, 1%. So the pass mark required was 50% and he got 49%. He passed every other subject and there were like nine other subjects, something ridiculous like that. You know, there was Afrikaans and maths and natural science and EMS and arts and culture and life orientation. And I think there was CAT or, or IT of some kind. Then they came to Cambry Learn and guess what? They could just move on to the next level. They weren't held back, especially because they just missed English by 1%. I mean, it's ridiculous to have to repeat all subjects when you've just failed to achieve at one single subject, right? So that's where it alleviates the pressure for children with difficulties in certain subjects. But let's talk about other accommodations also that Cambridge allows. What about exam arrangements? They call it access arrangements. So those apply to continuous testing throughout the year as well as to the final. If you have difficulty with writing exams, then you should not be measured on that alone, right? Because then if you underperform in exams, it's a bad reflection of your actual mastery of that subject, of your competence. It's more a reflection of your poor exam technique or your performance anxiety or your poor memory recall. Well, the beauty with Cambridge is they will allow you to submit testing to corroborate that and reports from doctors or from therapists, and then you will qualify for access arrangements. So what are access arrangements? Very simple. There's scores that you have to achieve in certain standardized testing that's you know, benchmarked globally. And if you meet those scores, you will qualify for arrangements such as extra time, a scribe, a reader, a prompter, special colored paper, oral exams. Okay, so you have a lot of access arrangements and a lot of accommodations that can be made at assessments. And that's at the finals, but you should get those throughout. And so Cambulin allows you to submit that application ahead of time. Now, you're not forced to use the concessions. So for children who don't want to be stigmatized, they don't want to be set apart, the first thing they should know is that when you get that Cambridge certificate, Nowhere does it say that you wrote them under special conditions or that you got extra time or you got a scribe or reader. That's why there are schools that specialize in dyslexia, for instance, that offer only Cambridge as their curriculum. So that just goes to show you that it is a myth to say that if you have dyslexia, for instance, you cannot cope with Cambridge. Nonsense. Now, of course, every child's unique and every child has different challenges and different severity of challenge. It does depend on the child. So I'm not going to say here that Cambridge International is for everybody, not at all. But online learning certainly allows you to cater for special needs because it allows that self-paced learning, that ability to pause learning at any stage, that ability to go back, go forward, fast forward, rewind. I call this... It's like satellite TV schooling, right? You can put it 
live TV on hold. You can rewind, you can binge watch it, you can, for cramming, right? That would be the equivalent of cramming for exams, you know, um, doing last minute studying. You can do all of that with the ability of non traditional schooling or online learning because it's got a repository of videos that you can search by theme, by topic, because if you're not happy to attend a live session, you can watch the recording thereof because you can do this at night. So for example, teenagers often have really weird circadian rhythms, right? They're not good for going early in some cases. They're night owls in some cases. They wanna study later. It doesn't suit them to have to go to a traditional school and keep regular hours. So again, with online learning, they have the ability to school on demand at their pleasure when it suits them, which means that they might do more concentrated studying after hours than during daytime. And that's okay. Or children with medical issues who are worse in the morning, who struggle with getting going in the mornings. It's not a problem. Then you study in the afternoons, you study in spurts, you study in short intervals. That also aids concentration. It's why children with attention deficit or who have struggles with concentration find online learning so much more suited to them because they feel like they can pause it, they can rewind it, they can fast forward, they can go at their own level, at their own pace, and they can examine only when ready. That gives them a sense of agency, of mastery over their own lives. That sense of agency is so important. It's what Carl Rogers said is so critical to children's success. That sense that they are in control of their own fate, they're masters of their own destiny. That is so powerful and liberating for children because now they don't feel like they're victims of a system, like they're at the mercy of a school system. So yet again, why this form of learning is highly suited to children with special education needs. There's something else. Okay, I had a meeting just today with a Cambridge school. There's inclusion as its policy. So there's kids of all kinds of abilities in its school. And one thing that one of the teachers said to me, which struck me, why this is so helpful to teachers is because you get independent marking. You get you know, objective professional markers doing the marking for you. So it reduces your marking load. You only really have to mark the prescribed exercises out of the activity books or the textbooks, but those don't even count for marks. So they're non-critical and they can technically mark themselves, but obviously at a very young age, it's better to have adult guidance. And it might also just be beneficial to have an adult check with them what their knowledge is at the various stages of the course material. But certainly when it comes to the assessments that we incorporate into our report cards, whether it's CAPS or Cambridge, those are powerful, powerful marking and assessment tools that are taken away from you to relieve your load and to allow you to focus on your core competence. So this is what the teacher told me today, which I think is so true. So I wanted to credit her for this. And that is, and you know who you are, I will not uh, mention by names, but it's actually the ability to focus on your core competence, which is what? Relationship building right? It's what COVID made so difficult. It's why it's so important to have tutors on hand or to have teachers who can assist at your side, who can be there in person or at least online in a more one-on-one -on -one basis than what a school provides. It's that personal touch, the human touch. That makes all the difference. That's how you inspire children. That's how you hear their stories. That's how you cater to their individual needs. That's how you give them personal guidelines. That's how you can show them what areas they need to focus on in their lives, what tools they might be lacking. It's that that is a core competence of a teacher, a core mission that sometimes gets lost when you've got a lot of admin, paperwork, and marking to do, which is important, but detracts from what you love and you most are needed for, relationship building. And that's why Cambry Learn seeks out partners so avidly throughout the world. It's why we incentivize with monetary incentives that our clients join via an affiliated tutor center or school. We prefer that they be attending a physical premises or have online support at the very least that's one-on-one -on -one. because we know that our teacher contact time is insufficient and is not of remedial nature. In other words, if they have special needs, they cannot expect that our teachers, our Cambridge trained instructors are going to cater 
for their needs. They can't personalize to that level. They're a school. We are still a school at the end of the day. Yes, we're different to traditional schools, but we're a school. We're teaching small groups. Yes, smaller maybe than at public schools and at many private schools. The digital classrooms might be as small as 15 kids or less. It's small, but it's still limited time with your teacher. You still have peers in your class with you in your digital classroom. You still are able to chat to your teacher unlimited, it's true, but it's text or voice note chatting. It's not face-to-face -face or in-person. It's not that warmth. It's not the body language that you can see, right? It's important to communication too. So that's what we learned through COVID is that you can learn online to an extent. You have a screen, 2D learning is quite effective because of its flexibility and its accessibility 24 seven and wherever you go. Yeah, the portability of the system is brilliant. You can relocate with it. You can immigrate with it. You can move educational systems and schools with it so much more easily. You can move countries with it, right? Because it's portable. It goes wherever you are on any device that's web enabled. No special app, no special tech required. Isn't that beautiful? So it's accessibility and flexibility is beyond compare. But most importantly, what it enables teachers to do is to focus on their core competence, relationship building, getting to know their children on an individual basis, and then tailoring a learning program for their children. Because we at Cambrian can't do that. We can't create a personalized learning plan for every child. There is no way. Our numbers are too large and we're distant, right? We're on screen. We're remote from you. Okay, so it's often called remote learning or distance learning or e-learning. It is not possible to the same extent to accommodate for your needs as an individual online when it comes to academic disability or challenge. It is not possible. What makes it possible is you, our trusted partner. So you see why you're so critical to our success, why you make our education real, why you make it feasible, and why we compensate you and why we incentivize students to join via you and to attend your center or to be supported by you, whether online or not. You see why. We strongly believe in you. We endorse your model of learning in combination with ours. So it's a hybrid learning model. It's a combination. It brings the best of both worlds because both models have inherent strengths and weaknesses, right? It's not that one is superior to the other. And that's a preconceived notion people have of an ed tech company such as ours. Top Dog Education owns Cambry Learn, right? And they get that confused all the time. They think that because we're a virtual school, we're anti-traditional schools. That we're the enemy of these schools. That we're in opposition to them. No, we're not. It's why some traditional schools have taken our platform. We are in partnership with Montessori's and other kinds of schools. So you don't have to be anti-school to use online learning methods. It can complement traditional school too. So the best we find is the blend the blended learning model of online and offline, on-screen and off-screen, digital and book-based, pen and paper. It's why it's so refreshing that Cambridge to this day, 160 years or more later, they still insist that your final exams be written on a piece of paper, that you answer on a script, that it gets sent and hand-marked. And the same goes for all assessments, therefore, in Cambridge Learn. And that, by the way, is how you know if it's true Cambridge, because there's a lot of people out there claiming to do Cambridge. But unfortunately, unless you're marking by hand, on paper, long and short questions, you're not doing true Cambridge. And Cambridge is really judged by its assessment. In fact, I've done a whole webinar on this. So I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but there's a name for it. There's a phrase that Cambridge have coined that is really the heart of Cambridge. AFL, Assessment for Learning. Okay, it's a little known acronym, but it's what Cambridge truly believe makes them different, sets them apart. So much so that Cambridge itself rebranded after 160 years of existence. So in 2017, a mere four years ago, Okay, just a couple of years before COVID hit, instead of being CIE, as it always been known for many decades, Cambridge International Education, they renamed themselves Cambridge Assessment International Education. In other words, they realized that they needed to emphasize that the 
key distinguishing factor behind Cambridge International Education was the assessments, the assessment tool, because they are strong believers that you teach through continuous testing. So testing is a teaching tool. Now that goes counter to a lot of what's happening lately in education, especially in American circles. So I know I have colleagues whose views I fully respect who are strong believers that testing is evil, something to be avoided. And this idea of high stakes exams are actually uh, old school and very outdated. Well, yes and no. I understand the pitfalls of standardized testing. I understand that exam anxiety, exam performance can intervene and can actually be counterproductive. There are ways to compensate for that. But at the end of the day, Cambridge isn't very much a high stakes exam system because you can retake an exam as many times as you like and only your best mark counts. So it's not as high stakes, I would say, as your matric exam system, for example, through CAPS, where very few people retake subjects or just repeat a subject. Okay, it's very difficult to upgrade a matric certificate through CAPS. Much easier with Cambridge because only your best result counts and there's unlimited attempts permitted. You can just keep retaking an exam until you pass it without having to repeat the year. As I said, very, very critical difference. Okay, but that's not all. This idea that you need to certify your learning. I know that some parents are not in favor of that. This idea that you have to have a piece of paper, a certificate, a qualification to prove your mastery of something. But unfortunately, that is still the prevalent model, especially in higher education. They need some kind of proof that you graduated from school with suitable skills to enter into the institutions. And employers are still looking at the end of the day for pieces of paper. OK, I mean, that's just the reality. The world may be changing, but it's not changing fast enough that you can get by without some proof of your learning. And that's what Cambridge affords you. But at your leisure, you can do it at your speed, you can do it when you're ready, you can repeat to it. So I would say, actually, it's not so high stakes an exam system, but is it an exam system? Oh yes, it's critical actually to its whole philosophy. Assessment for learning. Yes, Yolanda, yeah, you're asking good questions here. Yeah. Your daughter will finish grade 10 with impact this year. If she passes, can she go to grade 11? Absolutely. So the interesting thing with Cambridge qualifications is grade 10 and 11 is one level traditionally done in one year, or you can take it over longer periods, but it's actually been designed in terms of the guided learning hours that Cambridge itself recommends. It's been designed to be doable for a subject within a year, one academic year, which is any 12 month period. Remember an academic year does not have to start in the Cambridge system in January. In the Northern Hemisphere, many Cambridge schools begin around August or September. In the Southern Hemisphere, you know we run a calendar of January to November, but you can run any calendar on the Cambridge system. So yes, you can move from the national curriculum system to Cambridge at the stage of grade 11. Why? Because you're going to do grade 10 and 11 for those subjects that you require for university entrance, and you're going to do them in one year. And then you're going to go on to your matric level subjects called AS, and you're going to do those in one year. Now, remember, that's your typical finishing time frame. You can actually do them quicker. I mean, the record in South Africa is 14 years of age to finish school. 14 years of age to Cambridge. You're quite right. You heard correctly. I'm not exaggerating. Okay, I know the student's name. I know the dad. He went to University of Pretoria, and he's now through to honors or master's in physics. I think he's going to become a physicist. He finished school at 14 because that is possible. You can go at your own pace, which means you can really accelerate. I don't know if that's recommended for everybody because not everybody has the emotional maturity to match. And, you know, many parents would say kids just need to grow up in their own pace, in their own time and to enjoy childhood. And I would tend to agree. But that's a very personal choice up to each family. But just understand that there are no time constraints. There's no time limits and there's no restrictions by age as to when you sit Cambridge exams. Niels, welcome, welcome. We just spoke earlier today. Can a student that is in a traditional school join Cambridge, the CAPS curriculum and hold two final, let me just finish reading your question, sorry, and hold two final matric certificates? Well, sure, that's interesting. Why would you want to do two school leaving qualifications? I suppose you could, but that's duplication. Most kids want to do one or the other. You certainly can't mix the subjects at matric level, at your finishing level. 
you can't expect an institution of higher learning to recognize two different exam bodies simultaneously. So you have to opt when you finish school for one or the other. You can opt for both as you've suggested. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing's stopping you if you've done matric to now want to do matric again through Cambridge. You can, of course, just upgrade your CAPS metric and just take select subjects that many people do as adults. So they come later in life to need certain subjects they never took at school and then they take Cambridge subjects because there are no age restrictions and they can do it part-time online whilst working full-time, whilst uh, in a family with dependents, whilst holding relationships down. So yes, it is quite possible to do part-time schooling with Cambridge to upgrade another school qualification. Why you'd want to do two complete school leaving certificates in different uh, exam bodies, I don't know, but maybe you have a reason for asking that, Niels, let me know. Okay, what's the minimum subject? Just getting back to the previous question. Sorry, I didn't complete the answer, Yolandi. What is the minimum subjects Cambridge want for her to complete a grade? Like I said, there are no minimum subjects that Cambridge wants. Cambridge allows you to just take one subject. You never have to take any more. You can just do one subject for one year through Cambridge and never take another subject. Cambridge makes no rules, okay? Uh, but there are rules imposed by the national education authorities as to what constitutes a school leaving qualification. So in South Africa, for grade 12, you need four subjects at grade 12 level. And you need one subject at least at grade 11 level. But of course, if you haven't done grade 11 in another system, you will not have the foundations to your matric level subjects. So then we recommend that you add those four matric level subjects at grade 11 as well. So in other words, that you do five grade 11 subjects and four matric level subjects, dropping one of those of the five, right? You take five and then four of those five onto matric. Okay. She can apply at all South African universities or Cambridge, eh? and it, of course, will count overseas. That's the beauty, Yolandi, is that you're opening all doors, okay? With a Cambridge International Qualification, you can go anywhere, everywhere, South Africa or Namibia or Kenya or Bulgaria or the UK or Australia or America, Canada, you name it. Some kids like to be in a traditional school and opt to do CAPS as additional lessons, extra class. So yes, you're quite right. Uh, you can. So you can do it for pure enrichment. Okay. You can take a CAPS subject and add it onto a Cambridge uh, series of subjects. I'll give you an example. So if you want to take Afrikaans as a second language in primary school, Cambridge don't offer it. So you can do it through the CAPS system. So you're doing Cambridge core subjects, English, math, science in primary school, so year six, but you're going to take year six Afrikaans to CAPS. Just so that you're continuously practicing your Afrikaans, you're keeping it alive. And then when you get to high school, you can officially take a Cambridge level Afrikaans subject as a second language. But in the interim, you've got this gap. So that's what South African parents do. They wish to keep their second language alive, might be their mother tongue, but they want to have their child finish school knowing Afrikaans. Or you could pick a world language for that matter. You can still get to university in South Africa if you've taken French instead or Mandarin or Spanish. We only offer French as a world language, but you could take others, any other that Cambridge offers, and you'd still be able to gain interest to a South African university with Cambridge. Interesting. But if you want to keep hope uh, ho alive their home language or their mother tongue or their you know, ancestry and their cultural heritage, then take a language like Afrikaans or take Isizulu. Cambridge offer that too. Okay. But then in primary school, you'd have to take the CAPS version of that subject because it just does not exist in the Cambridge curriculum at primary school. How would I accommodate a student, interesting question, Niels, that wrote matric exams but failed one subject? So my advice there would be, if that child, that student is wishing to gain entrance to a particular institution, ask them that question. Say, look, I haven't got enough points or I have not got enough of a score in this particular subject. What can I do to upgrade it and then suggest Cambridge. So I'll give you an example. I had a student who had finished matric and passed, got his matric certificate, but he had dropped to maths literacy in matric because he had chosen not to go to university in matric. He decided he wasn't gonna to go to university, so he didn't need pure maths. He could just take maths literacy. So to make his life easier, right? Let's be honest. He could have done it because he had been doing pure maths up until that stage, grade 10 and 11. But he got to grade 12 and he's like, I'm not going to go to varsity. I'm going to drop to maths literacy. And he got his matric certificate because you can matriculate in the CAP system with maths literacy, which is not pure maths, but it's good enough. It's enough maths to get you a matric certificate because in CAPS, maths is compulsory. 
for matric, not in Cambridge. Okay, so now he chose to drop, to drop to maths literacy and then changed his mind after school. Now he'd be finished with school, I think it was the next year, and he wanted to now go to university, he decided he wanted to study law, but BCom law, there's the catch, BCom law at the University of Pretoria. And guess what they said to him? Sorry, we don't accept maths literacy. So now he's stuck. He's got his matric certificate, but he can't gain acceptance to the course he wishes. So he approached them and he got in writing that if he took maths AS, which is matric level maths to Cambridge and got at least a C for it, they would accept it. So there's an example of how you can upgrade on a particular subject without having to go back to school and doing all the subjects. But Niels, my recommendation there is that they check with their particular institution, whether it be the University of Pretoria or Stellenbosch or Totterstrom or you know, Rhodes or UCT or wherever, please ask them the question, what can I do to upgrade my matric certificate because I'm missing these points or I'm missing this particular subject. I didn't do it, I didn't take it at all. Or I didn't score sufficiently high in it. How can I upgrade it? Okay, you're most welcome, Niels, thanks. Um, speaking of that, there's a lot of confusion out there in the South African higher education circles about the APS score. It's a calculator that you use to sum up the points you get for every symbol that you achieve in certain subjects. And you constitute that with all seven subjects that you have to take through CAPS. Because in CAPS, you have to take seven subjects for matric. But now I've just told you, and I said to you, London, this, that you only have to take four subjects for matric with Cambridge and go to any university in South Africa. So the confusion arises. People then say, but I'm missing subjects. So how can I have the same points? You won't have the same points on a calculator as a CAP student. You'll have fewer subjects, hence you'll have fewer points. But don't worry, they calculate that differently for Cambridge because they understand that no one takes seven subjects for matric with Cambridge. No one. You don't need as many, so why would you? You can always do a few extra. There's nothing stopping you from being above the minimum. Because keep in mind that minimum alone is no guarantee of acceptance. You might qualify with matric equivalents and with full exemption, right? But it doesn't mean the university has to accept you, right? They're not obligated to make space for you, right? They may decline your entrance because your marks aren't good enough or because they're better candidates. So it will be in your own interests to often exceed minimum requirements, but I'm just telling you what the minimum requirements are. And of course, it depends very much on the course you're applying for. Different faculties might have extra requirements like medicine will do an interview, they'll ask for a CV, they'll expect community service, you know, different faculties like the arts faculty, if you're applying to the fine arts, they might want you to show them a portfolio of your work. If you're applying for dance, they might want you to do an audition or for music. Okay, so it does vary by faculty, it varies by country even as to what requirements there are for entrance. So you've got to make that research your own mission. Or you can seek us, our advice, we will then put you in touch with the specialist in university placement. We're not specialists in university placement for the world. We can't be. Every country has different rules. Every faculty may have different requirements. So we cannot know all those rules worldwide. Okay, but I am getting a bit off topic here. But just know that Cambridge is ultimately designed to be university preparatory. The GED is not. Okay, so that's another difference between GED and Cambridge. It doesn't mean you can't go to university with GED. It just means that you may well be lacking certain academic skills because you've been tested purely by multiple choice and you may have only been studying for a couple of years and not built up a habit, a study skill, an ability to research and to write extended essays as is expected at university, a certain level of analytical skills. And that, bring to an end our webinar tonight, is why Cambridge gets this reputation for being so academically rigorous and so difficult and therefore not appropriate for children with special needs. Wrong, it is, but yes, it does rely more on application of knowledge. So it's more about teaching skills than it is about teaching content. Okay, so a nice way to think about it is Cambridge teaches you how to think, not what to think. So it's not so reliant on your recall. But again, that can be an advantage. If you've got a child whose memory is compromised, right, who's got short-term memory issues, so their recall is poor, especially under stress and exam anxiety, then a system like Cambridge, which is far less reliant on recall, on memorization, on factual recollection, 
and is far more uh, reliant on application of that knowledge, on problem solving, then children who have memory weaknesses will tend to thrive in that system because they don't have to memorize and spend so much time trying to commit to memory a whole lot of facts. They can simply use the knowledge and they have already tried a whole lot of past papers and exhibited their problem solving skills there. And they can use that methodology, those processes, those thought processes that they've developed, they can apply those to new context, to new unseen problems in an exam. So that's another reason why Cambridge can be very useful for children with special needs. It is not immediately ruled out just because you have a memory deficit or concentration difficulty, or you have anxiety, or you have dyslexia or dyspraxia, or whatever. You know, you're vision, vision impaired, or you have a language processing difficulty. Whatever the issue may be, have it assessed, have advice from someone who will tell you whether your learning profile and your ability allows you to cope with a particular curriculum and then be matched to that curriculum. Maybe you should be doing CAPS, maybe you should be in Cambridge, maybe you should be doing GED, the American High School Diploma, because watch the space. Cambridge will be offering the American High School Diploma shortly and will be offering another British exam board. So we're not beholden to Cambridge. I know that we've become synonymous in certain territories with Cambridge International Schooling, but keep in mind that top dog education that owns Cambridge Learn started out offering content for CAPS, for the South African curriculum. Okay, so another way to look at it, I'm gonna end on this note because I'm gonna think of what I discussed with the school teachers that I met today. Our teachers and our content provision is there so that you have content and assessment tools at your hand to be used as you feel fit. The teachers on site or online that support our service, they then provide tools for assimilation of that knowledge. They actually enable that to be acquired and to be applied. So they do that through their teaching skills, their concern for their kids, their passion for learning, and the ability to give each child a personalized learning plan, each child their own journey, and to give them unconditional positive regard, as Carl Rogers calls. Okay, so yeah, children with special needs can cope with Cambridge. You don't have to have an assessment before you join. No, Moshina, thanks for asking. You can actually just join, but keep in mind that if you're going to expect exam concessions at the end, you should rather apply for that early on so that you get it across all assessment forms, formative and summative. So continuous assessment should be done under the same conditions that you'll face at the end. So you're not taken by surprise at how those get applied. If you have one student that did his online schooling at Khan Academy, Okay, so Khan Academy is content provision. I wouldn't call it a school, you see. So people get confused between content and schooling. What makes a school a school is if you have interactive teaching and assessing and you can come out with a qualification, you're certified to accredit people, then you're a school. Khan Academy is not a school. It's excellent. Hey? I'm not knocking their content, but they're merely providing content. Okay, so he was schooling using Khan Academy. Okay, nothing wrong with that in South Africa, not in the US. They can't issue me a certificate. Correct. Khan Academy can't issue anyone a certificate because unless he went on to write standardized American tests, which are not provided by Khan Academy, he won't get certified anywhere in the world. Okay, so what is the student to do? Well, he should actually just start on the school system that will give him a certified exam result, Cambridge being one of them. Okay, that's what I would recommend, Neil. Okay, so Neil, this is the problem with doing content for free, is that you don't have the qualification certified. Should they do everything over? Yes, because you've got no certificates from any other system. Of course, you can skip levels if you've got the knowledge. You can. Remember, you don't have to progress from you know, the previous level that you left off at. You can go into the level that you're ready for. There's no prerequisites with Cambridge. So you don't have to start your whole schooling from scratch, but you do need to go into the right subject level and then you need to certify yourself in those exams. I'm sorry, but that's what's required. Okay, so that brings me to the end of tonight. Eh? Uh, how many subjects do you have to choose from, Yolandi? Oh, they're all listed, eh? They're up to 14 or 15 at uh, IGCSE and higher, although Cambridge itself offers 70, but that's because they've got all the world's languages, right? From Urdu to Mandarin to, you know, I don't know. Okay, uh, so 
go check it out on our website. They're all listed on the catalog. We do offer computer skills like coding. We do offer business skills, entrepreneurship, like EMS, and we do offer economics, business studies, and accounting. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I uh, Thank you, Michelle, a regular attendee. I really appreciate your attendance and I appreciate your participation, Yolani. Thanks for all the questions. Thanks, Niels, for joining us. Please feel free to contact me afterwards if you'd like further personal consultation. It is best done individually, case by case, with kids with special needs. Let's treat every child as unique because they truly are. Have a good evening. Bless you. And thank you for your attendance. Good night.